sit right back and you'll hear the tale. The tale of a fateful myth that started one fine Theban day when Zeus stole a fleeting kiss. Um, it proceeded past a kiss, um, Zeus being the incredible fertile, incredibly fertile god that he is, he soon got the young Theban princess Semele with child because that's the sort of fertile god he is. Hera, you'll recall from our last exciting episode, tricked Semele into asking Zeus to revealing himself in his full Zeusliness. When Zeus revealed himself to Semele in his full Zeusliness, he burned her to a crisp. But as I suggested, the little baby god Dionysus was down here in this burning smoke of ashes. And so Zeus took the little baby Dionysus, sewed him up into his thigh, and carried him to term. Not a really auspicious beginning for the sort of religious worship you'd want coming into your town. Dionysus, the young baby god Dionysus, was raised by satyrs and nymphs and stuff, and grew up to become the god of wine, partying, and ecstatic possession. More about which in a second. Let me put you on warning, let me reiterate my warning to you from last time. Anybody putting down on a test, even once, that the Bacchic religion, the Bacchic mysteries of Dionysus were a partying kind of go-with-the-flow kind of religion, religion where everybody just kind of like party down. I'm not even going to read the rest of your essay. I'm going to give it maybe a 5 out of 30 and let you deal with the consequences because it's much more than that. I told you a few of the stories about Dionysus and his buddies, the god Pan, god of the Pan flute, Echo, the promising young river nymph who fell in love with Narcissus and stuff like that. But the biggest feature of Dionysus' early myths, the myths about Dionysus when he was a young lad, are so-called rejection myths. in which some idiot or group of idiots makes the bad career move of rejecting the worship of the god Dionysus. I mean, after all, who wants to worship a go-with-the-flow, partying kind of god who dresses up like a cross of Boy George and Carmen Miranda and Dennis Rodman, very topical. That's a Dennis Rodman. Um, I mean, this is a religion. Not any kind of religion I want. The rejection myths. The number one rejection myth, my favorite rejection myth, is one in which the young little god Dionysus, he's a young god, he's a kid god, is sitting along the beach when a pirate ship rows up to him. And that's a picture of a Greek pirate ship. They say, let's kidnap this little bugger because he looks like he's got some money and somebody might pay money for him. All of the pirates but one agree that that would be a good idea to rip this kid off, hold him for ransom. The one who didn't was the steersman. He said, I don't know. This just looks very suspicious to me. The pirates load the little kid who is Dionysus onto the boat, take him out to sea, and all of a sudden they hear this you know, which is my approximation of the beginning of When Doves Cry by Prince. The mast of the ship turns into a wine. It turns into a grapevine. A bowl appears upon the ship. Dionysus changes into a lion. The pirates are also terrified at this sudden development that they jump off the boat and into the ocean, becoming the first dolphins. That is one etiology of the dolphins. 
instead of pirates. That's right. Was the steersman? No, the steersman probably you know got a box of donuts and got to go on and live the rest of his life. I don't know what happened to the steersman, but the I could make something up. The main thing is that these people denied the divinity of Dionysus, and they paid for it. They spend the rest of their lives as dolphins. Dionysus was not one of the twelve original Olympian gods. He had to claw his way into it, into the Olympian pantheon. This is a reflection, if you will, of a, what we consider to be a historical fact. God bless you. That the religion of Dionysus <laughs> spread, God bless you, from east to west from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, into Greece, winning converts as it came, and also hacking some people off big time. Let me give you a whole list of rejection myths. In Argos, which is a city in ancient Greece, the daughters of the king deny the divinity of Dionysus. Ah, that little... Wimp, he's not a god, he's just this wimpy little drunk who hangs around at clubs. And they are driven mad. They join the chorus of Bacchic women. They dress up in leopard skin tights and go, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. In the daughter in the fine ancient Greek city of Orchomenus, which could also be translated, no kidding, as the land of a thousand dances, the daughters of the king deny that Dionysus is a god, and they are driven mad. And they too join the line, the conga line, of women dressed in leopard skin tights, going, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, Dionysus rules. In Thrace, the king of Thrace, a guy by the name of Lycurgus, denies that Dionysus is a god and gets zapped by Zeus with a thunderbolt. These are just the rejection myths that we know about. These are just the rejection myths that have survived down to our time. I have no doubt that there were more. But the basic plot structure is the same thing. One a misinformed human or group of humans denies that Dionysus, god of wine, partying in ecstatic possession, is an authentic god, and two, pay for it by either getting zapped or going nuts or something else horrible happening to them. I pause for your question. Ray. Way to go, Ray. You are, of course, disputing the professor. Well, I apologize. <laughs> Don't apologize. Kids, try this at school. Ask your professors questions. You're paying them money to answer the questions, and you're liable for these questions on the test. So, kids, ask the professors questions. I'll get to it in a second, Ray. But you're right to call me on the carpet about this. The very best rejection myth story of all Bonjour, mes petites medettes. Um, the very best rejection myth story of all is the Bacchae of Euripides. Euripides was a playwright who died circa 400 B.C. And I'm not sure, I don't believe that the Bacchae is in your edition of the Greek tragedies. It's worth walking to the library and checking out. It's even worth buying. Okay? The idea, the plot of, and by the way, the um, Modern and Classical Languages Department will be sponsoring on one Thursday night, either this month, next month, or some other time, a showing of a movie form of the Bacchae. Be there. Be square. Um, the, yes, Fairlin? You were futzing with your hair. Here's the plot of the Bacchae. Dionysus, who you will remember is a homeboy from the city of Thebes, 
wants to come home to Thebes, his mother's hometown, and establish his religion there. Mark. If myth has it that he's from the city of Thebes, how did they explain the fact that it was a east to west type thing, right? You read in the book a lot of things most used about him coming out of like the Persia or something. Well, you'll recall that he was carried oh, off to be raised by satyrs and nymphs and stuff like that. So he grew up somewhere else. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to find out that we don't have satyrs and nymphs and stuff like that in the city of, Th of Thebes because we've got King Pentheus ruling Thebes. King Pentheus, oddly enough, is Dionysus' cousin from a collateral branch of the Theban royal family. He is very young. He is exactly, um, he is exactly, more or less, Dionysus' age. Crystal? No question, okay. I have a cousin who is more or less exactly my age. He's a high school principal now. This is very scary. Over here we've got Pentheus, Mr. Law and Order. The guy who says, we're not going to have any conga lines of um, um, leopard skin clad women rushing around my town and going woo-hoo, woo-hoo, because I've heard that they fornicate. I have heard that they commit unnatural acts of lust in the nude while they are drinking alcohol, and so on and so forth. Ray, the living embodiment of this mindset that says, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, it's a partying religion, go with the flow. Okay, over here we've got Dionysus, the god who says, when the elevator gets you down, go crazy. Let's go crazy, let's get nuts, let's lose all restraint, slip off this mortal coil and live for the moment, feel the power of the god inside you. Put on the old leopard skin and go run around in the Great Conga line going woo-hoo, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. I'm not going to summarize the plot of the Bacchae, but it's wonderful. It's scary. It's frightening. Dionysus approaches the town disguised as a character known as the Stranger. Kind of effeminate, wimpy looking kind of guy, saying, you ever think about worshiping Dionysus? He's more than just a partying woo-hoo religion, Ray. To which Pantheus's response is, I don't want any conga line of, you know, leopard skin clad women dancing around the hills in back of my town. And he throws the stranger into jail. Okay, I know how we're going to nip this problem in the bud. Throw the perpetrator in jail. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, this time, it doesn't. From the comfort of his jail cell, the stranger, who is really Dionysus, drives the women of the town of Thebes crazy. And this is what it's like, according to Euripides, an ancient Greek living around 400 B.C. How sweet it is in the mountains, when out of the rushing throng, the priest of the roaring god falls to the ground in his quest for blood, and with a joyful cry devours the flesh of the slaughtered goat. The plain flows with milk and wine and the nectar of bees. But the Bacchic celebrant runs on, holding his pine torch and the streaming behind with smoke as sweet as Syrian frankincense. He urges on the wandering bands with shouts and renews their frenzied dancing as his delicate locks turn in the breeze. Amid the frantic shouts is heard his thunderous cry, Run, run, Bacchae, celebrate the god Dionysus on your thundering drums. 
honoring this deity of joy with cries and shouts of ecstasy, while the melodious and holy flute sounds its sacred accompaniment to the mountain, to the mountain. Every Bacchic woman runs and leaps in joy, just like a foal that frisks beside her mother in the pasture. These people are getting seriously crazy. Okay? And interestingly enough, this is also one of the better descriptions available of what the Bacchic mysteries were all about, to the extent that we know what the Bacchic mysteries were all about. It was, after all, a mystery religion, and you still haven't told us about the initiation. And I know you never will. Nor will any of the devotees of the Bacchic worship ever confess to the good church father, Marcus, over there, that, you know, the secrets of the religion won't happen. But basically, what little we know about the ritual of the Bacchic mystery religion revolves around four things. Number one, enthusiasmos, which is a Greek word meaning having the God inside you. It doesn't mean I'm really enthusiastic about LLT 121 classical mythology. It's really great. To the ancient Greeks, it means a state of having a God inside you. It means drinking wine and feeling the power of the roaring God. That power you get, remember, when you have your 14th beer and you decide to throw the TV out the window? We call it methanol poisoning today. We call it drunkenness, inebriation. To the Greeks, it was the roaring god Dionysus, having the god inside you. The second feature is ecstasis. Now, I know what you're going to say, or somebody might want to say that this is a synonym for climax or orgasm or some drug-induced state. It means that today, or it can mean that today. What ecstasy meant to the ancient Greeks was very simply standing outside. Standing outside of your body, standing outside of your life. It's still one of the reasons why people drink or use drugs today. To get away from the cares of their life tonight, let it be Michelob. Okay? These poor ancient Greeks are trapped in the bodies of working bubacuses and Jethras. Their lives are nasty, brutish, and short. They have no hope for a responsible, happy afterlife, yada da, yada da. It feels good to let the god Dionysus enter your body and to step out for a little while of your ratty little ancient Greek life. The third salient feature of the Bacchic mystery religion is called Sparagmos. The ritual tearing apart of the flesh of a live animal. That sounds pretty grody. It is. But keep in mind that the ancient Greeks saw Dionysus as the god of wine and ecstatic possession, and they drew a link. They drew a line. They made a connection between wine and blood. Wine and blood, the life-giving force that runs through the bodies of all animal beings. Step number four, or salient feature number four, is homophagia. The ritual devouring of the raw flesh. It sounds, well, if interpreted wrongly, you could say these people are really enthusiastic about having ecstasy. They tear live animals apart, then eat the raw flesh. I don't want this religion in my town. And there is really no way to make it sound really appealing. I grant you that. But if you look at modern religious practices today, even in this corner of the country, we still have these ideas. 
we still have the idea of having God inside you. We still have the idea of worshiping so intensely that you are no longer a person occupying space in the here and now, but you are somehow transported into a ritual communion with God. There's the idea of, um, you know, partaking of the flesh of God and drinking the blood of God. It's not all that weird when you look at it that way. Question, Chad. Okay. On the other hand, it can sound like a fake holy orgy. And this is the way that Pentheus takes it. Pentheus says, I'm going to have to put a stop to this. I'm going to have to stamp this stupid thing out, nip it in the bud. But before he can do that, the stranger comes in, Dionysus. He says something on the order of, hi, Pentheus. How would you like to see what those wild, wild women are doing out in back of the mountain. And Pentheus says, yeah, I'd like to see those floozy chicks committing unspeakable practices with each other. Um, solely, you know, to get to know them, to be a better king for the city of Thebes, to better understand what makes them tick, of course. To which the stranger replies, of course. But first, what you have to do is dress up as one of them so you can pass as one of them. To which Pentheus, the law and order king of Thebes, says, Okay, I understand that. And he changes into this catchy little leopard skin number. You know, and he puts on a little hair scrunchie and some eye makeup. And, you know, pretty soon he is a beautiful lady. And he says to the stranger, who we know as Dionysus, how do I look, stranger? And the stranger replies to him, you look to die. Which is a very sick joke because that is exactly what Pentheus is going to do very shortly. Obviously, he is being suckered into a trap by his own curiosity about the Bacchic religion, by his own suspicion, Ray, that this is just a partying religion. You know, where wild, wild women go off into caves drunk and do dirty things to each other. By the time that um, Dionysus gets Pentheus to wear full drag, he is gone. Pentheus looks up and sees two suns in the sky. Then Pentheus turns to Dionysus and asks him in the strictest of confidence, have you always been a bull? <laughs> I mean, it turns into a non sequitur contest because Pentheus is really gone. Dionysus is driving him berserk. And here's what happens. Dionysus leads Pentheus through the city of Thebes as all the people of Thebes saying, huh, Virgil, quick, come see, there goes King Pentheus, and he's dressed up, dude looks like a lady. And he goes out to the hills out in back of Mount Sithiron in beautiful downtown Thebes, climbs up a tree to watch the Bacchic women get drunk and fornicate. What he sees, of course, is the women of the city of Thebes. Yeah, they're dancing. Yeah, there's loud music. Yes, there's wine drinking. Yes, there's enthusiasm as the god Dionysus is inside all of these women. Yes, there is ecstasy as the women are stepping aside out of their bodies of women in a patriarchal society who are expected to be baby machines and cooking machines and stuff like that. They're getting down. They're going crazy. And all of a sudden, one of them looks up. There's a man in that tree. Uh-oh. So here's what happens. The tree bends down, and Pentheus, dressed up in drag, winds up on the ground with it, where the Bacchic women circle around him. They don't know it's him. All they know is some man is profaning their holy ritual. 
And here we will let Euripides again pick up the call. Pentheus's mother was first, as high priestess, to begin the slaughter. She fell on him, and he ripped off the band from his hair, so that his mother might recognize him. And he cried out as he touched her cheek, Mother, it is I, Pentheus, whom you bore years ago in the house of Echion. Have pity on me for my sins, and do not kill me. Do not kill your son. But Agave was not in her right senses. Her eyes rolled and her mouth foamed as the god Bacchus held her in his power. She seized his left arm below the elbow and placing her foot against the ribs of her ill-fated son, wrenched his arm out of his shoulder. It was not done through her own strength, but the god made it easy for her hands. From the other side, Aino clawed and tore at his flesh, and Autonoe and the whole pack of Bacchic women converged upon him. All shouted together, Pentheus moaning with what little breath remained, the women screaming in triumph. One woman carried an arm, another a foot with the boots still on. Pentheus's ribs were stripped clean, and they all, with blood-drenched hands, tossed the flesh of Pentheus about like a ball. That's pretty scary. Bacchus, or Dionysus Ray, is nobody to mess around with. This is a rather graphic illustration, obviously, of what the god Dionysus can have when he drags people out of reality. Alternatively, Dionysus could just stand for an externalization of an urge that Pentheus already has. Maybe Pentheus' law and order type behavior is just his attempt to rep repress his wild and crazy side. I wouldn't doubt that most of us know somebody who comes across as really stern and having their act together, but is capable of just flying off the handle and going nuts. And you wonder, which is the real person? I myself am a wild and crazy guy quite often. I would suspect, just to make it short, that most of us have a little Dionysus in us. Everybody has a little Dionysus in us, which we ignore at our own danger. Try to shut it down completely, and you will fly off the handle, I think. I pause for a quick question here. Phil, and then Farallon. Was the um, Bacchus religion predominantly women? Everything you Yes, it was, as a matter of fact, which didn't exactly, brilliant question, Phil, add much to its cachet, if you know what I mean. Keep in mind that the Greeks are a patriarchal society, and that as, you know, men and husbands and stuff like that, we sure don't want our wives hanging around with other women, having a meaningful religious experience with a wine god that we're not even invited to, and stuff. Good question. The men that the, we do know that men from archaeological evidence know that men were allowed to join. Okay, we know from literary evidence that uh, men were allowed to join. For example, in the Roman histories of Livy, there the Romans had a visit from the Bacchic cult right around the 180s BC. All of a sudden, the worship of Dionysus that fruity little puke and his, you know, wine-guzzling pervert women and bad music showed up in Rome. And the Romans stamped it out. The Romans put to death people who believed in it. The Romans passed serious laws against it. And yes, Mark, it was a foretaste of what they were going to do when another quote-unquote cult, which claimed to eat the flesh and body of their Lord showed up in town. Crystal. When you first started talking about that, and you said that uh, Pentheus 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he got out and went back to him. Is that what kind of happened? Or what? That is correct. Okay. That is to say, you know, and even that crystal could be interpreted as a symbolic representation of you try to put that bad crystal, you know, the, in, in a little jail and be the responsible college student and hard hitting young future lawyer slash doctor. But sometimes it creeps out and goes crazy. Good question, well answered. Did any of the women get in trouble for this in the story when they came back? Um, yes and no. You know, in the very most annoying tradition of Greek tragedy, Pentheus' mom comes home saying, hey, guess what? I am the great huntress. Look what I killed. And she's carrying her son's head. And her dad, Cadmus, says, um, honey, look again. Then she really goes berserk, and then Euripides, these Greek tragedians don't have any interest in the what comes next. Okay, we'd like to have the loose ends tied up. You know, it just leaves us wondering who's right? Who's more wrong? You can see where being too repressive, you can see where trying to grab too firm a grip on your life can be destructive because you just can't have that much control over your life all of the time. But at the same time, this is not exactly an apology. This is not exactly a ringing endorsement for the Bacchic religion. Yes, it is a valid religious belief, but it does get out of control. And when it gets out of control, it can be very dangerous and terrible. As so often at the end of a Greek tragedy, and as always at the end of the really good Greek tragedy, there are no winners and there are no solutions. I pause for a question. Yes, Elizabeth. Why, thank you. Yes, we will. We'll do it right now. Thank you, Elizabeth. Keep your professors on the money, because sometimes I get so in love with the sound of my own voice, you never would have guessed, that I forget to do what I'm supposed to do. Ritual is number one. Is that correct? There is ritual. Number two is emotional content. Doesn't get more emotional than that. What's number three? Morality. Any opinions? I'm not going to say whether it is or isn't because I just got three different opinions which is wonderful, which is part of the joy of reading classics. You bring your baggage to it, you read it, you pour your baggage on it, and you drag out of it whatever you drag out of it. I would suggest, my own personal opinion, it is amoral. That is to say, if I were to go tie on a snootful this afternoon, I would probably be more of what I am, only more egregiously, so that is to say, my normal, such as their characteristics, would be exaggerated. On the other hand, there are people in the world who get drunk and turn into absolute jerks. They're nice people when they're sober. They turn into absolute jerks. Who knows? I leave that to you. That's the joy of the classics. What was number... Okay, so morality... I would just call it amoral. But remember, when you write essay questions, I'm not looking for you to barf back what you think I want you to think. So you can argue that one from here to kingdom come. Hopes of rebirth. Uh-oh. Huh. Resurrection. Huh. Get to that in a second, Elizabeth. I haven't forgotten it. Number six. Is it state approved? You gotta be kidding. No way, Jose. Hit the road, Jack. We need a resurrection story of some kind. Because didn't I suggest, didn't I flat out say to you that the mystery religions 
offered some sort of hope for satisfying immortality. This is where the myth of Zagreus comes heavily into play. And I'm going to write his name on the board. On the board like this, zoom in, zoom in, because um, he's going to be on the test. I once asked on a test, who killed the baby Zagreus? And some guy actually put down, oh, I don't know, but I wish I did. <laughs> some may see in the myth of Zagreus a story that has just been tacked onto the story just to add a catabasis just to, um, I had this behind my ear through the entire class and nobody even told me. Uh, just tacked on just to fill in slots number four and five. But that's been done before too. Supposedly, Zagreus is the child of Persephone <coughs> and Zeus. That you didn't know. Notice that Persephone is a goddess associated with the underworld, so-called Chthonic, C-H-T-H-O-N-I-C. You don't have to know that word. You don't, but I'll write it. It means pertaining to the earth. It means located underground. Mark, make it quick. It's never spelled out. So there. But I would guess it was after. I would guess because this myth has underworld overtones. But I can't prove it. That's the frustrating thing. When Hera finds out that Zeus has fathered a child on Persephone, Hera says to the Titans, rip him to shreds. Tear this little baby apart. And so the mean, nasty Titans tear him to shreds, little bitty baby Zagreus. Oh yeah, Zeus is not happy. Athena appears on the scene to save the heart of Zagreus. Athena takes the heart of Zagreus and feeds it to Zeus. Yeah, I thought that would make you pull your head up, Mitch. Sounds pretty contrived, doesn't it? Oh, I knew that was coming. Don't worry, I, I, I got something to fix you guys. You got a quiz coming up on Monday, and I'll read you some ancient Greek takes on that theme from Lucian's Dialogues of the Gods or something like that, where, oh great, he's got kids popping out from all over his body. What a Zeus. Um, Zeus devours the heart of Zagros and proceeds to get it on with Semele and beget Dionysus in the usual way. The implication being that this baby Zagros lived on in the heart that Athena saved and fed to Zeus. Zeus, having eaten the heart of baby Zagros, beget Dionysus. And Zagreus, the little baby Zagreus, lives again in the life of Dionysus. So it fits together. It doesn't want to make, make me want to jump up and yell amen either. But for what it's worth, it's an attempt to work in some notion of resurrection and rebirth into the Bacchic mystery religion. I pause for a question here. God bless you. Even if it doesn't really do it for me in a major way. Zeus, in his anger at the Titans, destroys the Titans with a thunderbolt. He turns the Titans, your name is Scott, to ashes. And from these ashes of the Titans, the human race springs up. Yet another award-winning, Chad, etiology of the creation of humans. Is this like the fourth time that the Titans have been killed? Yeah, sure. It's like Wile E. Coyote, isn't it? I, I mean, 
while E. Coyote falls off the cliff and, you know, he's flat as a board and he comes like this like an accordion, but he's still all in one piece, you know, for the next show. Okay, Ted. You know, I'm going to have to break you two up. <laughs> that is a skeptical little child of the 20th century type question. Worth asking, but here, this story, the ancients, this is a good question. We're not going to get to Orpheus today. Orpheus can wait until after the quiz. I like Orpheus, you know, I'll hold off on the Orphic mystery religion because this is something you can take home and live with. The ancients did have several ways, and this is not just the Greeks. It's a number of ancient civilizations had any number of different ways of explaining the creation of humankind. We today would say e either one is true and the other one is false or it just won't wash. The ancients saw these different theories of creations of the universe as each illustrating one facet of a particular truth that is in its entirety too big for a human to comprehend. Did that make sense? Kristen, I can try it again. That is to say that this particular story, in all of its bizarre details, says that humans have a spark of the divine in them because the titans are, are you know, children of Uranus and Gaia. They devoured the flesh of a baby god. They were turned to ashes. And the whole human race sprang up from these ashes. No, it doesn't exactly mesh with the ages of humankind that Hesiod and Ovid tells us. Nor does it mesh with the Deucalion and Pyrrha story that Ovid tells us. Nor does it mesh with the ages of the creation of woman that Hesiod also tells us in the same book. But if you take bits and pieces from all of these stories, you get the impression that the Greeks were casting for a way to try to explain how humans could have a spark of the divine in them. Or you could look into it, the myth of Pandora, and say Greek men were looking for a way to imply that Greek women, that women were a punishment to men. Okay, you take bits and pieces from each of these, and you can sort of cobble together an idea of the Weltanschauung that produced these myths. Does that help a little? I thought that was pretty brilliant myself. Okay, Ed? Mark, I guess the biggest question, dare I ask it, is how could morals be created when Dionysus was born? From the world in the first place? See above. Okay. See above. Larry? <coughs> Did they use it for, like, to explain population? Interestingly enough, I, um, there, I think it's in the Iliad where the Trojan War, you know, the gods and goddesses are having a meeting up on Mount Olympus and um, somebody, Zeus says, well, this, will, this war will be good to keep the population down. That war was a form of population control to the ancient Greek gods and goddesses. More questions up to this point. So it, the um, Bacchic mysteries did have a resurrection myth, an ersatz resurrection myth, I grant you. This is a gross stuff, doesn't make me want to jump for joy either, but it does explain, one, you know, the, their hopes for rebirth and also the fact that their God went through all of this. I pause for a couple more questions. They did believe in a happier afterlife, but again, we can't know too many details about it because it was, after all, a mystery religion. That would be nice to think. Farallon? Most likely, but again, um, yeah, the Bacchic mysteries, the Bacchic mystery religion um, was never really as organized as was the Eleusinian mystery religion. We tend to think today of churches, of religious denominations, like the, um, the nerve center of the Catholic Church is in Rome, the nerve center of the Assemblies of God is in Springfield, Missouri, and so on and so forth. 
and the nerve center of the Eleusinian mystery religion was in Athens. The Bacchic mystery religion, if I could offer an analogy, would be more like the very early church, or very early Christian church, where you have you know, different groups of worshipers off in far-flung regions don't have necessarily a lot of contact with each other. So, I mean, we just can't know. We cannot know. Other questions? Maybe one I can answer. Jo Jeremy, right? Yeah. Okay, in the book, um, that story about Pentheus. Mm-hmm, Pentheus. And, and uh, Dionysus. Isn't it, doesn't it say that Dionysus um, crumbled the castle and that's how mm -hmm. no not how he crumbled the castle he got out right but I thought it said that, that he lay beneath a bunch of rocks and the stranger went to him and revealed himself as Dionysus and said you know this is who I am he doesn't specifically say who he is because he tricks you know he could come down and say I'm a god haha <laughs> I'm the god Dionysus now die sucker <laughs> But it's much more gripping, much more reflective of how life usually works. You know, I'll close with this. I'll close with an ancient Greek buzzword that you can always, buzz phrase, that you can always fling around on a test for extra credits. R.T. Manthano. which is ancient Greek for, quote-unquote, now I get it. In the Oedipus, the Oedipus Rex, Oedipus Tyrannus, Oedipus the King, you know, this poor schmuck has married his own mother, killed his own father, and he did it all 20 years ago. He goes through the entire play saying, no, it wasn't me. He goes through the entire play saying, curses on whoever killed my mom and dad, who killed my dad and married my mom. Bad, 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 bad not even recognizing that he, his own bad self, had done it. And right at the end he goes, Arti Manthano, now I get it. Same thing with Pentheus, as he is probably being torn to shreds. He is going, oh, this is a serious religion. Now I get it. And I suggest to you that that is part of what is tragic about tragedy. It would have been so easy if you know, the boyfriend or the girlfriend from hell who made your life miserable for two agonizing years of your life. If you could have just looked up and say, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good, and walked away. No, you get two years of hell and now I get it. That's life, folks. Have a nice weekend.